Spencer, political columnist, Sunday Express. Each Sunday, he forecasts future political developments. So let's wander down memory lane and see how some of Crossbencher's predictions during 1962 turned out. He has a keen eye for trends inside the Labour Party. A powerful body of Labour MPs is convinced that the deputy leader, Mr Brown, is a liability. The candidate they would like could be Mr Harold Wilson, but that cautious chap will have nothing to do with this. Harold Wilson stands as candidate for the Labour deputy leadership. Mr. Wilson will be certain to defeat Mr. Brown. Brown defeats Wilson by 30 votes. The crossbencher knows just how the voting will go in by-elections. At Lincoln, the Liberal intervention could easily have the effect of putting Labour out and the Tory in. Labour wins at Lincoln, majority up 3,000. But it's in detecting shifts inside the Cabinet that his ear is closest to the ground. July the 1st. Cluster around now, all you hopeful Tory backbenchers. I bring the news you so anxiously await. It concerns the big government reshuffle which everyone has been expecting this month. But what is my news? There won't be one. July 13, Macmillan carries out big government reshuffle. <laughs> Mr. Macmillan has decided that as long as the pay for stays, so must all the ministers responsible for that policy. Which means not only Mr. Selwyn Lloyd. Selwyn Lloyd sacked. But Sir David Eccles. Sir David Eccles sacked. And Mr. John Hare. John Hare not sacked. And while Mr. Harold Wilkinson is attacked by the opposition over defence, he too is as safe as a pheasant in the close season. Watkinson sacked. Even Mr. McClay, secretary for Scotland, is secure. McClay sacked. <laughs> in the past two programmes, Bernard Levin has launched his invective against two big groups of people, scientists and PROs. Tonight, he's confining his attention to one big man, Mr. Charles Fawcett. Mr. Forty heads a vast chain of restaurants and hotels which cover the country. A good man, then, to speak up for British food and British beds. And Mr. Levin, as a travelling man, has had fairly nightmarish experiences of both. If there's one word to describe the British hotel and restaurant industry, and there is, that word is disgusting. <laughs> uh, there are other words that might be pressed into service in an emergency, lazy, inefficient, dishonest, dirty, complacent, exorbitant, but disgusting just about sums up. It sums up what? Well, to begin with, sums up the attitude of the average British hotelier, which is roughly that he's in a business, that the rules of business therefore operate as they would in any other business, and it doesn't make the slightest difference to him whether he's running a hotel or restaurant, manufacturing boot laces, or selling insurance. In other words, he has no pride in his great craft, he has no feeling for service, and he has no genuine wish to house the traveller or feed the hungry. And if we complain, we are told falsely that the Catering Wages Act has made it impossible for hotels and restaurants to retain sufficient staff to ensure that the customer can have a meal when he wants it. Now, apart from the fact that the Catering Wages Act was only passed because the industry was too mean and unscrupulous to pay decent money, <laughs> it may come as a shock to many hoteliers and restaurateurs in this country to learn that it should not be beneath their dignity to put on an apron and cook and serve a meal themselves. It may further come as a shock to them to discover that if visitors have children or dogs or even both, it is their simple duty to cater for these by no means exotic beasts. <laughs> Rather than display signs announcing that the hotel resolutely declines to cater for either. It may even come as a shock to go to the other end of the scale to many British hoteliers and restaurateurs to discover that they could make mayonnaise quite simply with egg yolks and olive oil, rather than providing bottled salad cream which tastes and is probably made of little bit boot polish. <laughs> it may indeed come as a general shock to their smugness to discover that the reputation that Britain has abroad as providing the worst public food in the world is almost entirely justified and almost entirely their fault. And what is it? Love things in, in a moment. As much as you wish, Mr. Forty, in a moment. As much as you wish. Why is it, and you will tell me in a moment, no doubt, that the great uh, traditional hospitality of mine host, with his pride in good food, is almost entirely dead? Why is it that in a city the size and importance of Manchester, say, there is not a single hotel that I could recommend to a foreigner without blushing? 
Why is the restaurant food in Glasgow served cold? Why is the catering at London Airport a major national disgrace? For me, the thing is summed up. The incivility, the discomfort, the inefficiency, the general nastiness, in an episode from a Dartmouth hotel, where the proprietor asked if he would be so extremely obliging as to provide breakfast the following morning at 8.15. At 8.15, mind, replied with the indignant and immortal cry, you're not on the continent now, sir. <laughs> But very shortly afterwards, I was. <laughs> All yours, Mr. Foster. Mr. Levin, I think you must have been travelling third class everywhere and choosing the most impossible spots to stay at any time. Uh, I'm perfectly convinced that British catering is on a par with any other catering in the world. <laughs> <laughs> All third class and impossible travellers? <laughs> Is the audience a breach for this? No. <laughs> <coughs> now, let me tell you this, Mr. Levin. If we change the catering in this country to continental catering, you would be the first one to say. Life here is different. Our system of life is I different. Think so. People, I'm sure you would. I I've don't ask you to change it to continental catering. I'm perfectly willing to have simple, decently cooked, inexpensive or expensive, depending on my pocket, English food. No, you you won't provide anyway. that. But surely we do. The, you uh, see, we... the clue to your attitude is, is summed up in your very first remark when you accuse me of travelling everywhere third class. Suppose I do travel everywhere third class, and many people can only afford to travel third class. Why should they not have, at their price level, food as good and warm and promptly and efficiently and friendlily served in decent clean surroundings as anybody with a lot of money who can go and stay at the best hotels and buy the best food. What's wrong with a third class traveller? Excuse me, Mr. Levin, most of the catering, uh, most of the caterers in Britain supply that type of food at reasonable prices. Come, come, at two reasonable prices. Come, 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 come. We would I like to serve. Serve. They like, we most like of the catering, serve. Most of the larger catering companies cater to the public and cater, cater, cater to the public with limited means. And they do it very well. Where on the continent could you find a similar type of catering at the price provided for in this country? Where? Just tell me. Come to France, give me, Mr. Forte. Come to Austria, come to Germany, it's come to Belgium, come, come to Austria, Holland. Austria, Germany, Holland. What about the relay routier, the, 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 the lorry drivers, pull-up? We've written in the British pull-up for lorry drivers, Mr. Forte. I have. You probably run, sir. I have. <laughs> you eat in them? I've eaten. Uh, you look surprisingly well in the circumstances. <laughs> I've eaten very well. Mm. Where can they provide bacon and eggs as we do in this country? Where? Well, in Mr. Forte, in the Rue Moulin? Terribly sorry to have to tell you, Mr. Forte, I ate your bacon and eggs at lunch today. <laughs> and the bacon tasted of nothing but salt, and I had to ask three times for a glass of wine, and the plate was cracked. Yes, but you're not of my bacon. Yes, I am. Your restaurant had your name outside in letters that high. I understood we're talking to a catering trader, not of my yes, restaurant. Well, certainly, but you brought up the case bacon eggs, and I didn't happen to have them today. <laughs> I, can well, I can assure you that... The last time. We, <laughs> if you're talking of my restaurant, we increase our business consistently. Uh -huh. So some customers must be very satisfied. Well, but this is exactly what I'm complaining you must about. Be because a lot of customers are satisfied, and I entirely agree, a lot of customers, perhaps the majority of customers, don't complain and are satisfied, 